Hello everyone, my name is Tracy Rosenberg. I'm a grassland restoration farmer in Northeast South Dakota. My land sets upon the east slope of the Coteau de Prairies in the Glacial Lake District and has a spectacular view of the Whetstone Valley. Abbey Grasslands is roughly 980 acres of mostly native remnant in Grant County. Of that, 780 acres is a contiguous tract of virgin rangeland, and 160 acres are native hay meadows in two separate parcels. Note on this map the butterscotch brown patches. This is a drift watch map from a drift watch website where I am registered as a specialty crop. This will identify the parcels we will be discussing. First, a little background about the land's previous owner. In 1951, the land was purchased by a group of Benedictine brothers from St. Meinrad, Indiana, to build a monastery site to act as a respite while working <clears throat> across Indian reservations throughout the Dakotas. It is said that when the search team of brothers came upon the spot, they were instantly smitten with the beauty of the Whetstone Valley. But even more so were assured that this was to be their future home when they met with a Millbank banker about the land. The banker's name just so happened to be Benedict. It took the brothers 17 years to complete the monastery, which is 98,000 square feet. For decades, they operated sustainably. That is, they raised their own food from beef to pork to honey and garden produce. They were a closed community of monks until 2012, when the numbers of monks had dwindled to only 14 and most of them were in their 80s and beyond. They elected to close the monastery and depart. As for myself, I was raised on an Iowa farm just south of Des Moines. It was a century farm of about 1,500 acres, which was quite a bit in the 60s and 70s. But after graduating from high school, I took a job and moved to Des Moines, where I lived in urban life for the next 35 years. A common question I often get is, why did you come to Marvin, South Dakota? And the answer is to find the northern tall grass prairie. In 2011, due to a life circumstance change, I had the rare opportunity to redirect my life and decided to return to country living. As a child, my parents had both pastures and cropland, but by the time I had graduated from high school, they had converted everything to monoculture crop fields. So in an act of sentimentality, I sought to buy 100 acres of grassland but my search was in vain. You see, Iowa, while once covered by prairie, has less than one-tenth of one percent prairie remaining. On September 24th of 2012, this article was published in the Star Tribune. The article summarized what I already knew, that prairie was pretty much thought to be dispensable. It could be sod-busted, rock-picked, and farmed. The article went on to quote the Hefty Brothers and others in Big Ag that made pejorative comments about tree huggers and bird watchers. And then toward the end of the article, another name surfaced, Pete Bauman, who uh, had worked for the Nature Conservancy, and he said that South Dakota had the best remnant grasses left. So early that morning, after reading this article, I sent an email inquiry to Bauman who promptly suggested we talk immediately, for as it turned out, he was to meet with the monks of Blue Cloud Abbey that very morning about selling their native grassland. Some conversations followed and a couple of months passed until November of that year when Pete suggested I come to see the land for myself. I drove six and a half hours north of Des Moines to be given a tour down the side of an old railroad bed and these are the photos I took that afternoon. It was pretty much degraded and eroded pasture. But there was a wistful look in Pete's eye that day as he exclaimed, with the right care, this land could be restored to prairie in as little as five years. Two months later, Pete phoned again, and this time he delivered a question from the monks. I know this is crazy, he said, but 
I promised them I would ask you, so here goes. They want to know if you'd be willing to lease the land while they look for a buyer for the monastery and its surrounding land. Oh, and one more thing. You can't put cattle on it or hay the meadows, so basically you'd be leasing it to set idle. Before I could even second guess my answer, the word yes popped out of my mouth. And so the journey began. When I arrived in April that spring, I had no idea the extent of the land. I even had a neighbor show me around. This image is the first past flower I had ever seen in my life. And then soon thereafter, some prairie smoke bloomed. I was elated about the forbs that I found until another neighbor, Ariel, crop dusted his pasture, which drifted across the hay meadow. Within two days, the forbs had withered and died. As the rental tenant, however, I had the right to report the incident, which I did. And an investigation showed toward on. And the pilot was then fined $500 for applying pesticide with wind. And this is why today I am listed in the Drift Watch directory to help protect my land. But as if this wasn't enough, within the next several weeks, the pasture land had exploded in a carpet of invasive smooth brome. You see, brome is a cool season grass that overtakes native rangeland because it flourishes so quickly in the early summer. Then with a cool shady canopy, warm grasses, warm season grasses and flower, prairie flowers won't express themselves even if they are in the seed bank. So my rental year was a bust by June. There'd be little native species blooming that year. Instead, I used the year to travel about South Dakota and learn as much as I could about rangeland management. I was basically starting from scratch. I did grass clippings to determine the stocking rates for the pasture and in late summer gained permission from the monks to mow some burn lines in the event that the next owner would do a controlled burn. In late November, two weeks before my lease was to expire, the monks asked me if I'd like to submit an offer for the grassland they owned. I put together a very fair offer and presented it to them, figuring they'd think about it and get back to me in a couple of weeks. But instead, they sent me to the chapel to pray. 30 minutes later, they called me before them and said, we accept your offer. And then I thought, what had I done? For what started out as a search for 100 acres of prairie was now the ownership of tenfold that amount. So the girl that had spent most of her childhood walking pastures daily to check my father's cows, was now going to be a South Dakota custom grazing operator. Restoration is a compound word. It means rest plus action. Well, the year that I leased the land was the year of rest, and now it would be time for action to commence. Now, action includes one of the following, fire, grazing, and mowing, or any combination thereof. Basically, it means you must have disturbance. And so for the next couple of slides, I'll talk about fire disturbance. I learned very on that April burns were not a good thing. They were very productive in terms of setting back the invasive smooth brown, but they were sparky and dangerous. And this is the burns that I did in 2014. Oh, a year later, I switched to May burns, which are called green burns, and found they were the way to go. After all, my goal was to repress invasive smooth brome, a non-native cool season grass. Green burns also just mean basically dropping a lot of flame with a drip torch, and that's far easier to do than trying to put out April's sparky flames that had taken off rapidly. There are some general suggestions about prescribed fire. Only burn one third of a parcel each year. This way you leave behind nesting habitat. Also, the endangered Dakota skipper butterfly nests in my area, so it was important to burn smaller portions of the hay meadows. The results of fire can be seen here over those few years. 
um, in the pre-fire 2013. That was the year I leased the land and I had put some blue flags out to identify where there were um, prairie smoke. And you can see post-fire in 2014, um, there really, uh, you can't see any prairie smoke, but by 15 it had really come ablaze with prairie smoke. Um, incidentally, the Dakota skipper was found in this hay meadow a couple of years later, I think in 2017. Now on to the work of installing rangeland infrastructure to enhance cell grazing for grassland restoration. So we're moving away from prescribed fire now into the cell grazing concept for disturbance. I was able to acquire an equip grant which assisted me in modernizing the rangeland. But no, it's not for the faint of heart. For an equip contract includes much installation. I had to do all of these things and I had to have them completed within three years. A large task um, of modernization was installing cross fence. The original contract was to install 13 grazing paddocks. However, after completion, I subdivided those again. In 13 paddocks, cattle were moved about once a month. I actually rotate two separate herds. Um, there's a railroad that runs through the center of the pasture. But I wanted to tighten up the grazing schedule and move them more often. So you can see this went from 13 grazing paddocks to being split again and then again. So today I have over 40 grazing cells and they range from 8 to 35 acres each. And with this arrangement, cattle are moved every one to three days. It provides about 30 to 40 days of rest between grazing cycles and it also allows me to retain 15% of the rangeland as ungrazed for wildlife utilization and nesting habitat. This image was taken a couple of weeks ago along a fence line between my land and the neighboring land where herds are not moved or rotated. Um, and this was uh, pretty much mid-July. The cell on the left had been grazed 40 days earlier and the regrowth was ample enough even though we were in a droughty year. The neighboring land was gray short and really had not been given any recovery time. You can see quite a bit of difference here. I really believe in rest cycles and therefore I participate in CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program, so that I rest 15% of my total acres. Um, there's the short-term rest, obviously this rest that occurs between my complete grazing rotation cycle. Um, and like I said earlier, that's 30 to 40 days. Um, usually my first cycle is about 40 days and then it's down to maybe 35 days and at the end maybe 30 days. But 15% of the land is taken completely out of commission for an 18 month period. And just a little more about fencing. Um, when I um, when I gained this rangeland, I tore out all the interior barbed wire fences and replaced them with single strand high tensile wire and what's called wildlife friendly composite posts. These white posts are flexible, so if a uh, deer hits the high tensile line, it will, it will bow and then rebound back into position. In addition, I have subdivisions uh, with reels of poly wire and step in posts. And I have about 18 reels out on the range at any given time. And they provide me with a lot of flexibility to preserve special areas of concern um, and really move the cattle to where I want them to be. Overall, I have 18 solar chargers working on the range at any given time. And many of them are char charging miles of fence. Most of the perimeter fence is now new, uh, five strand barbed wire. I do use barbed wire for my perimeter fence except in an area of prairie reconstruction, which I'll visit later. I want to make mention that trash removal is um, really a critical concern. I try to do my trash removal in a conservation friendly way. That is, I haul off or burn the leftover tear out 
I roll up old barbed wire by hand and I discard it at refuge centers so I never bury wire in the field. Cross fencing also preserves my stock dams and dugouts. So cattle are not generally allowed in these areas. This preserves the integrity of the water areas and it also promotes better herd health and better stream health. And here you see the dugout that I, in my equip grant, I um, redid this dugout and I feathered out the berms. You don't see the high berms on each side. Um, this makes the dugout more wildlife friendly as well. So deer are more likely to utilize this area. Even though I have four stock tank, or excuse me, four stock dams and a dugout on this rangeland, my land is actually considered dry range. The water areas are too far apart um, in the pasture, and it leads to cattle overgrazing some areas and underutilizing other areas. And so I installed pipeline. To date, I've installed about five miles of above ground pipeline, and I have. 18 stock tanks out there. Each stock tank is about 750 gallons of water. This entire system is rural water fed. And this is a little more in-depth look at my stock tank stations. They can support the entire herd, which is 110 pair. Um, and each one has a wildlife escape ranch or ramp, which is necessary and required through my equip grant although I fashioned my own escape ramp so that they would um, go to the bottom of the tank, just not to the water level. Each tank is, as I said before, 750 gallons, so each stock tank station has 1,500 gallons of storage available for the cattle, and this is um, enough uh, storage capacity for 120 pair, but I'm only stocked at 110 pair, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In addition, I have two solar watering stations. Um, these can be used to pump out of stock dams or the dugout. And uh, so I can use uh, stock water um, instead of rural water, and I do in some of my grazing cells. The smaller unit you see here, the blue unit, is really um, convenient because you can move it around. On the range and put it in different positions. It uh, also has a battery backup for nighttime fill. And of course, um, a big problem on uh, grassland restoration is getting invasive weeds under control. They are a constant battle. For pasture, invasive red cedars are a huge blight. Uh, to date, we have removed over 4,000 by hand cutting. The roots are larger than what is seen above ground. These trees are considered water hogs. Plus, they emit an oily residue at the trunk that is uninhabitable to grass. So you're actually reducing your grazing forage um, for uh, invasive species that really has no ecological value. Otherwise, we also fight Canada thistle and wormwood sage and also bull thistles. We dig, mow, clip, and spot spray. One last part of my project I'd like to mention is the 20 acre prairie reconstruction. This involved much prep work and an expensive reseeding mix. So this was an old soybean field that was reseeded, drilled with this list of um, prairie grasses and forbs. And um, once it was uh, installed, it took many summers of constant mowing because you will get just a massive outbreak of invasive weeds, particularly that this area of reconstruction was um, overgrazed. Um, and so there was, and also manure had been spread on there. So there was really quite a seed bank in there. We still fight weeds, but as you can see here, the grasses have finally somewhat filled in and I actually grazed this unit a couple of times in the summer. So finally, the stars of the show. In terms of disturbance, you need uh, either grazing, fire, mowing, or a combination thereof. I tend to use grazing most heavily. 
Um, so here's the herd. The idea is to emulate bison grazing using more people-friendly ungulates, that is cattle. We bring on 110 pair for 150-day grazing season. Um, we are not season long. We are seasonal grazing, not year long. These calves, however, are dropped before the first of the year, so they're about 350 pounds when they come on pasture, and they have put on 200 pounds before they leave the pasture. They were weaned in mid-August, and their rate of gain was over 2.3 pounds per day. In addition, the cows are AI'd before coming on pasture, and so they're very, very large animals as well, and very far into their gestation by the time they leave the pasture mid-October. Also run two cleanup bulls in the herd, one for each herd, that is. <clears throat> These cattle overall are fairly easy to work with. Um, my tenant often will cull um, cows that aren't performing well, and but then also brings the same cattle every year that he keeps. So they do remember the routine, and it's, it's pretty nice because you'll have kind of an alpha cow that will lead the rest of the herd. So here's a quick video of a move to determine to demonstrate how really truly easy it is. <clears throat> this herd is rewarded. The herd is always rewarded with fresh grass in each move, and in this case, they move through an entire grazing cell without even looking down, just to follow the call. And you can hear my ranch hen calling them and as you know notice the cattle are just moving through they're not even looking down they're just coming straight across this entire grazing cell um, and through this other bungee gate and into the unit we so desire my goal at Abbey grasslands is not only to restore native remnant but also to educate others of the importance of ecosystem biodiversity and sustainability so in this slide, you'll see a, several of the individuals that have come across the years. Um, I taught at a tribal college, environmental science, for seven years. And so you see a group of my environmental science students here on the range. We were doing a lab. Um, we also have had water quality um, teacher training on the land as there's a spring-fed creek that runs through the area. Um, there's a tour here where we did pre and post fire um, tour and we also hosted a grass and bird uh, symposia and uh, here the instructor is teaching a young one how to band a bird. And so from its inception in 2012, these pictures that I took that day along the railroad bank with Pete as he was introducing me to the area to what Abbey Grasslands has become. Um, over these seven years, um, we have reignited four of the major prairie grasses, that is switchgrass, big blue stem, Indian grass, and little blue stem, among other grasses as well. And also our prairie flowers are showing up. Um, we have forbs of all different kinds out there. Some are small little clusters, other times there'll be a large sweep across an area. It seems that every year I find something new that I had not seen the previous year. There are also many grassland birds on the range. We have meadow larks and bobolinks, grasshopper sparrows, sharp-tailed grouse, wild turkey, and even godwits. And what's important about grassland birds is um, not just for biodiversity, but they're also bioindicators. If you see these um, grassland species coming back, you know you're headed in the right direction. So they're kind of a litmus test for um, how the rangeland is recovering, including you know finding that Dakota skipper butterfly. So the range has come a long way. Uh, we have all kinds of soil microbes to insects, pollinators, birds, amphibians, reptiles, all kinds of botanicals and mammals. Um, insects are a very large part of range health. Um, this year, the Xerces Society has been on the rangeland looking at um, the various plants and doing some clippings for a study um, that's really to promote forb development on or uh, encourage forbs on rangeland. The cattle do utilize them, but overall, 
it really leads to a much more healthy system. And so I'd just like to end by um, reading this quote from Aldo Leopold, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of a biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And this is really kind of the motto that I follow, um, my ethics on the range, um, is really to do the right thing. I do not focus on how to make my land um, the most uh, lucrative because lucrative is only you know, thought of, unfortunately, as dollars and cents. Um, my land is profitable, but I also believe that productivity is more than dollars and cents. It really means whether the entire system is moving forward. Thank you for allowing me this time and space to share with you my project and passions. And thank you to Charlie Johnson Family Farm and for Moses for inviting me to share with you my conservation journey. I wish you well.